The next speaker is James Garvin, uh, who is the uh, chief scientist at Goddard Space Flight Center. Yeah, okay, that's what he is now. For me, he is the guy that had the stamina to count um, craters on Mars in the 90s, and by doing that very meticulously, he found out that our idea of Mars, that it was a dead planet with no more um, uh, volcanic uh, eruptions and no more activity, and had been like that for billions of years, was wrong. Because by counting uh, craters, he found that there must be recent lava flows and, of course, recent in the eyes of a geologist, which doesn't mean last week or even last decade, but, you know, half a million year ago or even five million years ago means that a planet isn't dead. And for me, that's what James is, someone who apparently cares enough to keep getting and digging at something and then get it right. James, uh, I would love to hear what you have to tell about the Mars discoveries at the moment. Well, thanks, Artemis. Thank you very much. Well, uh, well, can everyone hear me? Thank you very much. I want to take you on a tour, really, kind of like the Icelandic sagas, of what the science discoveries from Mars, especially in the last 14 years, of our program of exploration known as the Mars Exploration program, which is implemented at our Jet Propulsion Lab, has given us. And I, I'd like to leave you with the thought that the science discoveries that I hope to, to convince you are real, they come from a large community of scientists across universities, NASA centers, and private industry, um, are, are really the impetus for human exploration of this planet. And many of us have been working these missions all the way back to Viking believe this, and I hope I can give you that sense. Um, I want to remind you where we are. We are a long way today from Mars, even though we're in a very close approach geometry right now, very good for telecommunication. Um, and it's really, really striking, and I reminded our administrator of this about 15 years ago, that Mars is not our Mother Earth. It's a profoundly different world. It does, as Ed Weiler would say, does not read our textbooks. In fact, the mode we're in today for Mars scientifically is one of rapid, massive discovery. Our ideas are changing with a large community of scientists working with missions like Curiosity, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, the landscape's changing. We don't totally know what we have, and that's important as we look forward to the era of human exploration. In fact, Mars is an ever-changing frontier. We're just realizing the questions we have to ask to allow us as aware human explorers on that surface to do the jobs we do so well, that situational awareness. This is just a view we see of, of where we're going with curiosity over the next hundreds of sols, and literally as we drive every day, we see elements of a new Mars, the same with opportunity spirit, even way back to Viking. So let me paint that picture for you um, by reminding you that science organizes itself in different ways. For the last almost 20 years, we've looked at Mars science thematically through four primary themes. Obviously, we'd like to know whether we're alone in this universe. This is a profound question, you know, goes back farther than we can even record in history. But getting at the question of life, active biological systems, were they ever there, could they be there, is a really tough question. It actually took humanity a long time on Earth to understand the past record of life on our planet, even sometimes the extant level of life. Um, that was a joke, but anyway. Um, so to get at the question of life, we need to look through the record books, recording elements of climate change, m change of environment, the rock record, you know, the pages in stone that don't lie but are not always uh, available to us, and through the preparation for having us be there to make these discoveries. So we've organized our program through these themes following different threads, understanding the role of water. Mars is a water planet. We know that now. Um, understanding whether there's places that, if they were here on Earth, could be inhabited by or organisms. And finally, understanding what the signs of life are, and more profoundly now, could they be preserved? If they were there and they're not preserved, because they can't be, what good does that do us? We need to parse those through our program. So what we've done for the last 14 years with the, with the restructured program that some of us were so fortunate to, to work on, was develop a robotic science exploration program. Every step is driven by questions we've had, hypotheses we're testing, things about the Mars we want to know,
to get at those themes and in many ways enhanced by technologies, new approaches, new measurements. The Mars we've seen during the course of this program, as you see all the way back to uh, around 2000, all the way to present and moving forward, is about questions, measurements, approaches, vantage points. The same way we people would attack problems in science. So this is all about STEM. It puts together the engineering, the science questions, um, the math, uh, and the technology to solve problems. And we've been doing that remarkably effectively. Our batting average is literally 1,000. Many teams in the Major League Baseball would love to have it. We've done that really well since this program came about. Um, and it's a, it's a partnership with engineering. So I want you to understand, we can't do all of this without engineers helping us do that. And the fact that many of these missions survive today, way beyond design life, opportunity being a good example, is, is really testament to that. So let me explain the discoveries we've been making. This will be the movie version. Um, many of my colleagues would like to tell it and would tell it much better than I with more time, but let me try to do that. So first, let me remind you, the Mars we see is rather foreboding. It's not really waiting for us. It's extremely cold, oxidizing, can't breathe the air, lost its magnetic field, don't understand why the surface is covered with you know, large deposits of dust that are very inconvenient, um, sub-micron scale, not good for spacesuits or rovers or actu actuators or camera lenses. This is not the place you'd go for your summer vacation. Um, scientifically, though, it is. And we've learned that since the first voyages of, of the 60s and into the Viking era, that it really is impressive. It's what we see and what we get are really if you will, a little bit of a misnomer for what really Mars has done. So we have to look at the Mars today and project back in time to a planet that really, we think, records in its record books some things that really actually help us understand our planet Earth. So let's look at it. Mars has an extremely rarefied atmosphere today. I mean, in fact, we've often talked about the temperature at our toes versus, you know, for a short guy like me in my head, would go through a gradient of tens of degrees. Difficult to do here on Earth, common on Mars, even barometric pressure variations. The kind of surface liquid water we like here on Earth, necessary for the kind of microbial life that's rampant, can't exist today. Water in that state is, at least on the, on the short term, human life scale, days, weeks, is unstable. But that could change. Mars, in fact, does climate change really well. The record of water on Mars, in the minerals, in the landscapes, um, pretty much wherever we look, is there. We've learned that. So if someone says, we've discovered water on Mars, um, most of us science colleagues, at least for the last 20 years, would say, well, we kind of knew that. Thank you. Um, the question is, what does that mean? How much was there? Where did it go? How would that have affected the geological history, the internal evolution, the climate, and the looking for signs of life? Many of us believe that the, the Mars we see today at one point reflected a history where water was a, was a prominent surface feature. Lakes and seas, if not oceans, covered the lowlands. And by the way, I should point out, the reason we can do this kind of study is because way back in the 90s, we had the forethought to make measurements of the very fine scale topography and character of the landscape so we can literally flood Mars and play the tape back in time and ask what would it have been like? Is that, does that make sense? physics and chemistry. Um, and that's what we've done. This also allows us, of course, to figure out where to land in an engineering sense. So we flood Mars, and the lowlands in the northern plains, often covered with dust, here's the North Polar ice cap, large uh, basins like Hellas, the biggest impact site we've discovered in the solar system. These areas would have been underwater, and we actually see landscapes that reflect some of the signs geomorphically in the rocks and the landscapes that tell us this may have been the case. We're still looking for the shorelines and how that would be reflected in, in the shape of the planet, but nonetheless, we see that. And then there's the question of the record of life. And on Earth, we sort of know that, or at least we think we do. And we look back in time to the earliest times on our planet, coming out of late heavy bombardment. The planet became at least habitable by this single cell, single cell world or pre-RNA world into the, the world we know with primitive DNA a few billion years ago. That's recorded in the rock records. Things got a little better in terms of the atmosphere. And the more complicated organisms leading up to these, these good dudes, eventually us, came about. So that's what we think we know 
very simplistically about on Earth. The question is, we see records of these things recorded in the rock record on our planet, which is extremely dynamic. The question is, well, could this have happened on Mars, and could it have been preserved? And this is a key question. If it happened and it's not preserved, we can't tell. So how do we find out? How do we ask, is the Mars of today reflecting a history like this, or a flatline history, or even a history of extant life? So what we did about 14 years ago, after um, some setbacks in Mars exploration um, in the late 90s, we re restructured an entire program. We got the best women and men in the country together, working with our team at JPL. We put together a Mars exploration program driven by science with a strategy, strategy that said, well, first do the reconnaissance. Where do you go? It's a big planet, 150 million square kilometers. You can't go everywhere. So let's understand where the action is from orbit. Let's land where the action is and move around as if we were there, sort of Apollo without the astronauts with reasonably smart robots, and then eventually get to a point where we can do in situ analysis and return stuff from Mars to Earth. By the way, while we were doing this, we realized that there are meteorites delivered to us from Mars um, rather favorably by Mother Nature. We can also study and put that together to understand the planet, and we have been remarkably successful. Since the orbiters, known as Odyssey, and then the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, through to rovers like Spirit and Opportunity, landers like Phoenix, and currently Curiosity, and, and of course moving on to Maven, which is on the way, we have really rewritten the textbooks. The kids of 2000, those young millennial stemmers, would see a new Mars in their textbooks 2014. Things that we didn't know. We didn't even know about the, the paleomagnetic field back then. But these are just some of the, you know, the billiard balls reflecting the data sets we produced. Some of them have huge science value. The remnant magnetic field telling us Mars did have, we think, an internal dynamo. The topography, which is good enough to land things on, as well as to follow the water. The understanding of the minerals in the context of dust. The character thermally of the planet, even its albedo. We have seen a diverse planet with complexity over time. Um, let me just fill in the tape. And over those years, what we've been able to do through our missions is increase the resolution and the detail across the, the wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation to see the planet. We actually have a mini Mars observing system in place now on the surface in orbit to study this world, this fourth planet. And some of them tell us about the character of what the surface is like compositionally. Others tell us about the character at the scale we would walk on. And by the way, I love to tell this story. When we first put together the roadmap to have cameras that could see things the size of beach balls on the planet, many colleagues said, you know, we don't need that. Golly gee, why would one want to see those things? Engineers kind of did want it, I must add. But a lot of scientists said, let's, let's do other things. But I can say now um, with some confidence that the team that were able to build these amazing instruments for orbit, um, the success of those have allowed us to watch ourselves drive on the planet and make choices strategically that help us with where we are. So what did we learn from all this? Well, we started to see exposures at the scale we could put, imagine ourselves exploring. Relationships between rock layers that tell us of the history of water and wind involved on the surface, and even the detail to pick places to go. Um, and so we went from an era of first landing, Viking, this is Viking 2, in, in uh, September of 76. There's the flag, of course, color balanced, although the Mars atmosphere is not quite so blue. Um, amazing sight, uh, just a little side. The probability of landing safely in this boulder field was about you know, 40 to 50%. We didn't know it was a boulder field, and so we landed anyway. Um, pretty heroic. Um, we landed then with new delivery systems with the airbag-assisted um, Pathfinder Sojourner, moving on to the era of the rovers, which basically gave our program the, the vision at the surface to ask the tough questions that begat curiosity, where we are today, 606 days into our exploration. But the surface missions, starting with the first lander on another planet from Viking, have painted a continuously changing picture. Viking, cold, sterile desert, superoxidants, Nothing would survive that that would be related to modern biology. Transitioning into the rock world Mars that we saw with Pathfinder, into the history of water world we saw and still see with the Mars exploration rovers such as Opportunity, 36 plus kilometers and driving, into this world that we're now probing with new instruments with curiosity. So what have we learned? A lot 
and we still have not assembled the jigsaw puzzle. Mars has lots of interesting variations in composition, dust storms, active surface change on hourly scales, dust avalanches, um, a relic magnetic field, volcanism that could have been active more recently than we thought, explosive phases, impact craters that expose the surface like natural drill rigs, all this um, together with areas where we've actually seen the water. There's a the little trench from our Phoenix scout mission in 2007-8, exposing the water that we then measured and verified. Um, we've seen subsurface layering with radars that have been partnered with it Italy through the polar caps that show us the way the climate record on Mars is put together. All this paints a picture for a planet that is really profoundly interesting, alluring, and compelling to get ourselves there. But, wait, there's still, whoop, there's still problems. First, on our nice convenient Earth, we have Mother Nature's natural force field with our great um, magnetohydrodynamo, our magnetic field, protecting us from all that nasty stuff that Bill and Mike talked about that you'd experience if you left the protective sheath of our magnetic field. Mars does not obviously have bumps on it. It has relic magnetic signatures that we discovered from the Mars Global Surveyor magnetic uh, electron reflectometer experiment. Um, and we think then that Mars inside versus Earth is very different. We're a dynamic planet exchanging energy from the inside out with a dynamically rotating core, inducing an electromagnetic field, producing all this cool stuff, compasses work, all this. Mars, that story changed. Maybe it wasn't quite big enough to retain the convective energy to do that. We're still working on that. There's new missions we'd like to fly. InSight will contribute to understanding this picture as it launches in 2016. But again, a different world. Um, we also know that there's a diversity of kind of places on Mars. And the things you see here in terms of all these strange names of, of mineral phases and stuff, I, I won't go through them ad nauseum with you, but every one of them has a bearing on how you record the history of water and sediments that could preserve potentially the history of life if it is preserved as organic chemicals, or I should say, um, yeah, organic chemistry. We've seen all these things since we began, we began our program in 2000. And all this gives us, if you will, uh, the impetus to want to be there, to want to touch the rocks that contain carbon phase uh, molecules, to be able to go to the places with chlorides that might preserve records of life. We see chloride deposits on Earth in super dry, cold deserts that actually contain preserved microorganisms. So why not on Mars? Now, these become questions for biologists, not geologists like myself. But we've also been able to organize the landscapes of Mars in time. From the early time we call pre noachian before the floods of early Mars, late heavy bombardment, all the way to the present, through the different landscapes we've measured from orbit with these powerful reconnaissance steps. The Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, still orbiting Mars and relaying most of the data from Curiosity, is a recon asset like no other we've ever sent into deep space. And we put it in there in 2000 against many colleagues saying, do you really want that? to give us the vision to be able to do this. This is a record book like the stratigraphy geologists like Hutton and Smith put together in the 19th century for Earth. And we've done that. We have fossil river deltas, fossil river deltas on Mars. Imagine what the, the Mississippi River Delta would look like you know, in 10 million years. Um, places that reflect the layering history of the role of water and wind working together. And we've seen that Mars is pummeled by the stuff of space. Our atmosphere shields us. But Mars isn't, and every one of these blemishes now on the order of, um, whoop, on the order of 250, 300 of them tell us basically about the shallow interior of the planet as it is affected by the, the exogenic world of space. And our planet's being hit by these things. You all remember Chablinsk of uh, February 2013 and other events like that. This is common. We have the Perseids and the Aquarids, all the meteor, meteor showers. Well, on Mars, they're not showers. They produce impact events. And some of the bigger ones excavate craters the size of football stadiums to you know, small cities, and they expose the shallow subsurface. And we're realizing that's important. What you see on the surface is not always what you want to see when you measure things on Mars about some of these very tough questions we're asking. Um, we're uh, whoop, a little far there. Um, we're also. We've also discovered that Mars has gone through major changes in the way its geology is reflected in the rocks. 
from a time when it was wetter, this is a paper by Banfield and others, when it was wetter, and the kinds of volcanoes that erupted were explosive, St. Helens, Pinatubo, um, Shavulich and the Kamchatka volcanoes, even Rainier when it goes, to the kind that are today oozing lavas. This is a very important step. We've also seen with our, our Mars exploration rovers an amazing disparate history of water in the rocks at two different sites, thousands of kilometers apart. This is something we had not anticipated. Of course, we renamed things, blueberries and newberries in different sites. We saw brecciated rocks, perhaps made by volcanism and impact. Um, and then we transitioned. And when we re-began this program in 2001, we looked at the idea of putting the best instrumentation with the most powerful vantage point we could get on the surface. We did that through a mission known as the Mars Science Laboratory today with a rover called Curiosity. And this behemoth, the size of a Mini Cooper or a VW bus, carries with it 14 experiments, including ones that deal with weather um, and radiation, for feed forwarding for humans, for descent imaging, for chemistry in different ways. And she's been a beauty, performing beyond any expectation. I'll give you a brief synopsis now. We've actually made more measurements than even this slide purveys. Nearly uh, almost uh, 500 gigabytes of data has been released. You can see it all. Everything ranging from our own little self-portrait, which is an interesting piece of engineering to use an arm and photograph a selfie with 51 frames, but good job, curiosity, to the measurements we've made without actually touching rocks by using a laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy, a partnership with France. Um, to the instrument known as SAM that can actually measure things on Mars as good as the labs that measured the rocks that Buzz brought back from the moon, we can now do that on Mars without bringing them home. Talk about engineering vision. Science can now measure parts per billion at the level of detection where we can actually see that we contaminated aspects of our experiment with Florida air. We can do that on Mars with Paul Mahaffey's experiment known as SAM. And so let me just remind you again, we're a long way from home. You know, at, the, at closest approach, 35, 36 million miles, once every 15 years. But Earth and Moon are small dots relative to this dusk view from Curiosity. So this mobile laboratory, even though she sometimes moves at the pace of a giant tortoise, is an amazing feat of engineering as she makes her measurements. And she's seen things that, to me as a geologist, are spectacular. These conglomeratic rocks with rocks, bits of rocks made of other rocks is what we expect to see when streams and rivers leave deposits that are then baked into stone. This is Geo-1. Here it is on Mars, telling us Geo-1 works on Mars. That's good. Water flowed. Shallow water, we now know what it was made of. We've drilled Mars. Now, yes, these drill holes are the size of a dime, but we have drilled the, the surface, measured down centimeters, collected it, and made measurements inside our belly with this this integrated mass spectrometer, tunable laser spectrometer gas chromatograph system, a lot of words for a really cool set of hardware developed at, at Goddard, JPL, and in France that allows us to measure exactly what made the stuff you see here. And you can see the surface materials we've excavated are not the, the classic brown red or red color of Mars that is almost brown. So what we've discovered on Mars in 600 days of work is there are environments on Mars that definitely, if they were on Earth, were habitable. You could put microorganisms in there, keep the radiation down, and it would do fine. Their buildup of the kind of chemistry we know and love, this is the classic chinops, elemental stuff we need for life to do its thing. There was probably water there. The minerals in oxidation suggest there were energy, the kind of energy that some microorganisms even three billion years ago used on Earth, some use under the ocean today. So we have found habitability works on Mars. The question is, what does it preserve about what might have been there? And that's the challenge we face with Curiosity and beyond. One of the other things we did, not even imagined when we launched the mission. We took that rover with its mass spectrometer, um, and we were able to use it not only to measure what stuff is made of and how it got there, but by using some very clever chemistry, our team um, at Caltech and at Goddard were able to actually measure the absolute age of the rocks. This was a huge goal for Mars as early as 2000. We now did it on Mars as a side of, really, a, 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 as a sidebar to what we were trying to do. We also measured the surface exposure age. This is really important. While the rocks are really old, older than any rock on Earth, like the lunar rocks, they've only been exposed for a few tens of millions of years. And what we see in those rocks exposed is very important because we now know from new lab work that's been done around our community on this mission 
that the space radiation, that nasty stuff that we were talking about earlier today, destroys organic molecules. If you sit them there for tens of millions of years, they won't look organic. You won't know you found the stuff you're looking for. So we have to be more creative and clever. We think we understand that the, the materials that are buried deeper relative to these little hills and escarpments are protected from space radiation relative to those that are constantly being scavenged by the wind. So if you're trying to find organic molecules, that's what these little cartoons are, you really can't look out on the nice smooth parking lots because they're going to be baked by radiation for tens of millions of years. You have to go into places where they're either exposed or more protected. And this will be important for human explorers to understand that when we start exploring ourselves. So the Mars we see today is, is kind of like the badlands of the American Southwest or Mongolia, Kamchatka, I mean, or I should say Kazakhstan. Really rather telling, layered rocks. We love them. This is Mount Sharp, named for Bob Sharp of Caltech. This is an artist's rendering of what the ancient Mars could have been like. The measurements we've made of these isotopes of key elements from Paul Mahaffey's experiment with his team suggest that the, we can possibly understand the earlier atmosphere of Mars to be a window into whether it could ever have been habitable. This could help us understand what kind of place we could ask, is there a record of past life? And we've done that. So the Mars we see, this is it, you know, doesn't look like beachfront terrain today, um, is really a challenging terrain. We've actually seen wheel wear on our rover as we've driven across it for more than six kilometers. Um, we know it was habitable. That's the record in the rocks. What we don't know is how long that stage of habitability existed. And our science team on Curiosity and in the Mars program is trying to understand that. Was it a long period? Was it a short blip? Did it cycle? Carl Sagan talked in much better language than I about the cycling nature of climate on Mars. It was an attempted humor at lunchtime. Forgive me. Not funny. But in any event, um, we don't know. We have more measurements to make, and wh that's why the robotic program, the science push for human exploration to open our window, our eyes to the windows, are so important. Now, I have to show one bit of humor. We found some interesting rocks on Mars that one of our scientists found looks a lot like mummified seals you see in the Antarctic. We did not find a mummified seal on Mars, but you know, your imagination can take you wherever you want. Um, I found my initials many times, so I know I've been there. Some people think they've seen Walmart. I, you know, I, I'll leave that to others. But um, more, more, see, more importantly, we have been pursuing this line of reasoning. We have found the water, watered, altered rocks, ice. We have discovered that there are habitable zones on Mars. It's certainly in Gale Crater from Curiosity, uh, obviously at Meridiani with Opportunity, even in evidence in Gusev Crater from Steve Squire's mission. Um, we're still looking for this one. This is elusive connecting these things up to there, and maybe it will take this, maybe we'll get so far, and then it will take the humans. But this record of potential biology, particularly the record of past life, which we think will be a better hypothesis to test scientifically, um, is really important. So we've made great progress. The real question then is, how can we use this, this bow wave of science, this era of almost Renaissance-like discoveries with a large science community, Literally, more than 1,000 scientists across universities and other institutions are working Mars now. We've built up that community internationally. How can we use that to ensure the sustainment of this questioning regime to transition into human exploration? So I leave you in the next five minutes with my final thoughts. First, unfortunately, it's not easy. We've all heard Mars is hard in spoken in different languages. Um, and whatever, but you know, we really want to see whether there's any record of the kinds of carbon that would record the signature of past life in the chemistry and understand where that stuff goes and how that links to modern life. And this diagram by Jen Eigenbode, um, one of our best and brightest young scientists, you know, kind of shows all the action. And we don't know how things are escaping from Mars. We haven't understood how the surface water percolates in gullies. We don't yet know if there are brine flows. We think that there may be. The questions raised here about how all this stuff cycles, whether the carbon goes through a long cycle, whether it's mineralized, we got to get at that if we're going to be serious. And maybe it will take human exploration to tie that together. We have seen active features. Some colleagues believe these flows, these recurring slope lineae, otherwise known as changing things sliding down the slopes of crater walls, may be flows of brine, salty waters that erupt 
during times when they're favorable. Alfred McEwen and his team have found these in multiple sites. Um, could they be access to the shallow subsurface where there's reservoirs of these low melting point fluids? We don't know. Our next mission's on the way, MAVEN. A lot of people ask, well, well, well hold on, another orbiter? Don't we want more rovers? And of course, we'd love more rovers and we'd love women and men too. But this mission is all about getting at a key question from Mars that links to Earth. How is Mars' atmosphere and how has it lost its atmosphere? Because it's done that. The Mars atmosphere of today is not the primordial one. And on Earth, our atmosphere recycled itself and became habitable, oxygenated, and favorable. Mars, MAVEN, Bruce Joukowsky's mission with Lockheed Martin, a Goddard Space Flight Center with instruments from all over the world, um, is going to address that question. And after it does that, and it asks primarily how an atmosphere that is today rather unbreathably CO2, nice um, for plants, but not so much for us, how it has evolved in time by reading the record of what's happening today in situ through, through various experiments, even a mass spectrometer, and then looking back in time to how it might have gotten to this state, what that would inform us about Mars and link it to the history of the Earth. This is a profound question. The mission was selected competitively on the basis of its science and engineering, and that's how we do things in science. It's kind of like the STEM Olympics. You get to send a mission to Mars if you're real good, and you get a lot of whatever the, the judges score now, but good stuff. So, of course, this is um, Curiosity taking a little, self, a little selfie. So uh, MAVEN will do that, and already we know from Curiosity measurements with the SAM team that the record of this critical ratio that tells you about escape rates for atmospheres um, for Mars versus Earth is different. This is the new number. This was the range of uncertainty from Viking with very good measurements. This is what we thought we see from the meteorites presumed to be from Mars, and this is what we got from one, one data point from Curiosity. We want to fill in how it might have gone from this to there, and there's a trend here. These are big changes. We need to get at that, and MAVEN will do that. And after MAVEN does its science for nearly 700 days, we can actually use MAVEN as a relay satellite, as a telecommunication orbiter, using the electro payload from JPL to allow us to talk to rovers and other things on the surface. So our program is integrated the way human exploration will be. So, big final thing I want to leave you with is, this is what we're up against on Mars. 10,000 feet of layered rocks. Taking us 600 days to get halfway to get into this zone here. We want to get up into there by the end of the Curiosity mission. It's a long drive through rough terrain. You know, some of our best astronauts will tell me they could probably walk it in a day. It's taken us 600. So different economies of scale and efficiency. Of course, getting a person there is a different price performance number than sending a rover. So I leave you with a couple of, I hate to use these diagrams, but I do love them. I took too much phase equilibria in college, sorry. But today we have a science program up here. It's a science-driven program asking questions like Curiosity. It's what NASA Science Mission Directorate does. We are leading to humans to Mars. This is not a new chemical, which is stoichiometrically unclear, but it is, in fact, um, humans to Mars, this meeting. And this would be a, mission, a kind of goal that it would be, would be discovery-guided, experiential, open to serendipity by having human people, or obviously human people, women and men in contact with the science, not you know, multiple light minutes away, very different way of exploring. We haven't done this before. It will be different than Apollo, because the people will be on their own adapting because of light time delay and comm links. And this is what we're doing with the space station and the next steps beyond that. We put these together, all moving toward this goal. This is a key first step together with that, and you've heard that today. So how will we explore with people? Final point um, is there's lots of opportunities. One way is to use the kind of telescience that we've already used in the ocean. This is just an artist's rendering of how robots on the surface with people uh, obviously in a, like a large laboratory in orbit could operate and do the kind of things we want. There's different models in human exploration with different roles for people. They're all good. Choosing the one is not so important now. It's more important to get the people there with the questions to ask that science is informing. And this partnership that I've been talking about all the time, where the robotics open our eyes to what Mars is doing and we start to bring the, the human exploration in place so we can really attack the question of whether we're alone is important because people bring skills that our robots, however we build them, how long we take, we'll never catch up to. I mean, we will always be able to adapt, sometimes non-linearly, differently than our robotic warriors. And that's good. It's the partnership that matters, you know? And so I finish with a couple thoughts. 
We're here and here. This is a cool rock I really like. There's curiosity. We want to be here. A couple of women on the rim of a crater doing field science, biology, geology, climatology. This is a big step. This step is going to beget that. And so I'd like to leave you with two thoughts. Science has given us the ammunition to know what we want to ask when we go. And I think the robotic program will continue through our Mars 20 rover and missions in the, tw in the 20s to open the door to what we're going to need when we get ourselves there. And that will change everything, folks. This will be like the Columbus moment when people, women and men, touch Mars themselves with the robotic tools to ask questions that we can't ask today with our brilliant robotic program. So I don't think you've seen anything yet. Mars has never disappointed. It's a discovery engine. Let's keep going. Thank you. So um, I'm, told, I'm told I have limited time for a question. And remember, I'm one guy representing a science community of thousands. So don't pummel me with you know, too much. One question. One question. Yes. OK, uh, thanks. Great, yeah, great to be with you. Um, you have mentioned some results on water, on habitability. You have talked so much about organics. That will be the next step before looking for life. So uh, we have a mission in Europe, ExoMars, yes. where we search for organics and possibly signs of life uh, uh, with a drill. So what is the plan in the US and what are the next measurements that you, you think we need before okay. we go with humans? Bernard, thank you. And I'm sorry, I, Jim Green will be talking about the whole program architecture this afternoon. He's the planetary division director. I'm just a Mars science geek. But <laughs> good question. The ExoMars 18 mission is, is actually that leap to the subsurface that we've all been waiting for ever since I was on Viking as an intern. Um, to get below, below the depth where the ionizing radiation, the galactic cosmic radiation, will modify the chemistry, um, or at least we think that depth. And by sampling that stuff with a very powerful set of instruments, the Pasteur payload, Pasteur payload, um, together with an instrument developed in, in actually Germany and Goddard, MoMA, we will look for organics for the first time directly in the context of the geology, chemistry, physics of the sample. So ExoMars is a key step beyond everything I showed you. And the discovery potential of ExoMars in 18, the, the ESA uh, mission with Russia and other partners, is, is critical, as, as will the Mars 20 rover. So Bernard's question is valid. As we look at all this stuff going on, we're not done. The robotic programs have to keep going. Beyond MAVEN and INSIGHT, our lander to look at the seismic and, and heat flow background of Mars, there's ExoMars. There's the ExoMars mission in 16 to look at atmospheric chemistry. Um, there's our Mars 20 caching science rover. And then there's the 20s, open to all the young STEM people here. So Bernard, uh, excellent point. We're really thrilled to have uh, whatever, the degree of partnership we have with ExoMars 18, with this next generation rover whose mobility is both horizontal and subsurface. Today our drilling gets us this deep, and our wheel scuffs get us this deep. So we want to go. You know, I'm not six feet, but we want to go two meters. And Bernard's mission and Issa's mission will get us there. So, folks, science lives. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much.